I just want to start by, first of all, thanking Jewish Funders Network for sponsoring the, the call and organizing uh, the conversation, inviting me to moderate. Um, this organization, really from the top down, has demonstrated a real commitment to the field of Jewish arts and culture. Um, and we've been seeing that for, for the past number of years, particularly under Andres' leadership, but, but literally from the top down. Everybody has, has demonstrated great commitment uh, to the area and recognized a, a need to, to bring these conversations to the fore. Um, that commitment hasn't always been recognized or met by the philanthropic community, um, and particularly towards the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, but I think we see that changing. Um, about three years ago, we produced with, uh, in partnership with Jewish Funders Network and Righteous Persons, Foundation, a report called Devising Strategies. Um, for those that haven't seen it, we can provide links. It's, it's on the Jewish Funders Network or I can, uh, website or I can email it to you. But the, that first report, and we've now produced two of them, but the first report was really based on candid conversations that we had with JFN members and some other funders. Uh, we did roundtable discussions in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, and we asked some pretty challenging questions because we really wanted to get at the heart of why we weren't seeing uh, greater investment, sense of urgency. Um, so we were asking questions like, what are the barriers to entry for you in terms of funding Jewish arts and culture? Do you view it as somehow less than, less than other philanthropic uh, investments that you make in the arts, other arts? Why might you give $10 million to the Met, but only $10,000 to the Jewish Museum, and might there be something in between? Uh, might there be a happy medium here? And what we learned and, and what we heard was kind of the following. Um, I don't know how to evaluate good art. I don't know what the landscape looks like or where the best opportunities are that align with my other philanthropic priorities. I don't know how to evaluate the impact of arts and culture. How do I measure success here? Um, I'm investing in urgent existential issues like anti-Semitism and education and identity. And I don't see how these overlap and I don't feel the same sense of urgency there. Um, I believe that there was a time in American Jewish life where that connection between arts and culture and holding the community together and advancing our shared priorities and perhaps most importantly creating a sense of celebration and pride about Jewish identity was much clearer um, and we all gave to it and it was a big priority in for North American Sadaka. Um, but that hasn't really been true for some time uh, the Jewish Foundation for Jewish Culture, uh, sorry, the Foundation for Jewish Culture folded a few years ago, as, as most of you probably know. I see Elise Bernhardt's on the, on the call with us uh, and, and could probably speak to that later. Um, mm -hmm. Organizations like J-Dub and Bim Bomb have suffered similar fate. Um, but I do think that the tides are turning. Um, and at the last Jewish Funders Network, we saw some real momentum towards coordinated giving to overall Jewish arts and culture ecosystem. Um, and we saw some real movement in that area. Um, it's a conversation for another time and I'm happy to share with folks what's going on behind the scenes with that. But I think today's conversation uh, really helps us to understand why. Um, this is a conversation about how arts and culture can drive social change. And I think that really helps us to kind of connect the dots that for many of us uh, maybe have been missing or just haven't been illustrated as clearly as we would like. Um, you're going to hear from two uh, people that have thought deeply about this and had an impact uh, on these questions in, in very different ways. Um, so I want to really stop uh, talking and start hearing from our guests. So let me start with Isaac, um, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, who can uh, Brent, tell us a little bit about uh, how they've been thinking at the foundation. Uh, and this has now been, Isaac, I, I think a few years of, of thinking and researching and studying the field. 
Um, tell us a little bit about how you've been, you've been thinking about the work and, and where you see the, the intersections here. Great, great. Uh, so thank you, Lou, and thank you, David, and the Jewish Funders Network for the opportunity to, to have a conversation about these really important issues. Um, again, my name is Isaac Luria. I'm Director of Voice, Creativity, and Culture at the Foundation, Nathan Cummings Foundation. We are a multi-generational family foundation rooted in the Jewish concept of tikkun olam. Uh, a, uh, we have been around for about 30 years now, uh, and the foundation has focused uh, in each one of those years on how arts and culture can make social change uh, and in what way that will happen. So we are really building on a legacy here in, in, in our continued funding in that area and also uh, our work in the Jewish community, uh, which has been primarily focused on building the field of Jewish social justice uh, and also new forms of Jewish spirituality. Um, and that uh, intersection is really represented in the program I lead today uh, in voice creativity and culture here at the foundation. I want to um, uh, start uh, before I get into uh, a super like foundation professional slide deck, uh, start for a minute by asking uh, everyone here uh, to think about the last time a piece of art changed how you think. What's the last time a piece of art changed how you think? And take whatever image popped into your mind, whatever bar of music, whatever play you were at, uh, and write it down. Um, don't let that little burst of light go away. Uh, hold on to it, uh, and we'll think about coming back to it later in our conversation. Um, great. So I am going to jump into the deck now. Um, Uh, and feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I always like to answer them. I probably won't answer them during the presentation, but then I'll get a chance to a little later. Uh, so uh, this uh, slide deck is an overview of a strategy exploration we did at the foundation, in particular to think about some of our funding in Israel. Uh, for the last uh, 30 years of the foundation, we've always had a grant making portfolio in Israel. It is focused on building up uh, democracy movements, on building a shared society, on advancing uh, uh, women as agents of change, um, supporting Arab-Jewish partnership, religious pluralism, and other causes. Um, and we just uh, re, uh, sort of evolved our Israel portfolio to focus in three areas. One, on uh, lifting up democratic advocates in the region, uh, and two, focusing on building relationships between Israeli and American social change activists. Uh, and then the third area, which is an exploration that we are in uh, on doing right now, uh, is a focus on how uh, can we build a culture in Israel focus that, uh, that feels uh, like one of shared belonging rather than divisiveness. Um, so, uh, in order to develop any kind of culture change strategy, uh, we have been, and I, I was really welcoming Lou's comments earlier uh, about how you need to, that, that, that arts funding is often a place where you may be not sure how you're making impact or what that impact looks like. Um, and we here at the foundation have been really focused on designing strategy, right? We, we can say, uh, oh, this piece of art, like oh, you all did with me just now, this piece of art moved me in a certain way. I like it, or I uh, enjoyed that piece of music. I like this kind of music. I, I think what we're trying to do is elevate the conversation into the realm of strategy. What are we creating by funding art, music, cultural change strategies, um, and, and why? Um, and that has uh, really helped uh, ground us and, and help us design a funding strategy that would meet those goals. So here in the US, out of our arts and culture program, also with voice creativity and culture, we have been funding cultural strategists. 
Uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, made a large investment in something called the Pop Culture Collaborative that I encourage folks here to take a look at, which is how can pop culture help leverage social change? Uh, and it was a, it was a building uh, and an outcome of a number of conversations around this intersection of what is cultural strategy. We were seeing a lot of organizers, a lot of power building organizations, groups doing uh, organizing on the ground, turning to culture to help articulate something that they were having trouble articulating in the room, to move people, to change how they felt, um, and open their hearts to the possibility of a different vision. And so cultural strategists emerged as these people who got really good at that work. Um, and so a group of them came together uh, to create uh, uh, this article that this uh, quote comes from that I'm going to drop into the chat. Uh, Jeff, Kang, Jeff Chang, Liz Mann, and Aaron Potts. Um, and they named this uh, cultural strategy as a practice of creative social change that cracks open, reimagines, and rewrites fiercely held narratives, transforming shared spaces and norms that make up culture. So why does that kind of work matter? And I think it starts for me as a really a former organizer, I guess I'm still a little bit of an organizer, you're never not an organizer, but as a former organizer and discussing what, where power comes from, how do norms get established? Uh, how does power function in a society? What changes power? Uh, what opens up things that felt previously closed? Um, what allows somebody's mind to actually change? Um, I don't know if you're like me, but arguing with my uncle has never led to him changing his mind. Uh, so there's got to be some other way around it. So this goes to, you know, needing some term definition, right? So what is culture? Um, and I'm pulling, uh, uh, again, a definition from this paper that, that Jeff, Liz, and Aaron put together, but that culture is society's prevailing beliefs values, customs, and ways of life, as well as the practices that transmit that culture. I imagine if we were to pop into the chat with a few ideas about uh, what Jewish culture is and what those beliefs, values, and customs are, uh, not only would we get a lot of uh, uh, folks um, and we, uh, you know, adding their, their views, we, we could also have a bunch of disagreement about what that culture really is which is a powerful thing to, to remember, that actually that disagreement uh, is very important to our culture um, as well. Culture is never static. It's always changing and moving and being contested. Um, culture can be an enslaving uh, uh, norm, can create enslaving norms. Um, just think about our, our culture's approach to LGBTQ Americans just a few decades ago. Uh, and, and how much change has happened uh, in order to, to liberate, uh, to change the way that people have an experience of and relate to LGBTQ people. It also defines boundaries of what is allowed in behavior and thought. Um, I, I mean, just think about the different ways that cultures hail cabs or taxis. Uh, if you go to Paris, uh, Britain, Israel, uh, or New York, or even San Francisco, right, where you don't even hail a taxi anymore, you only call a Lyft or an Uber. Like these, these kinds of boundaries uh, are defined by our culture and often it can look really weird when somebody's doing something outside that cultural practice. Um, so we're always enforcing boundaries as well. And the last bullet here is really a claim that we're making at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. I think it's an assumption. It's something that folks have contested a lot um, I'm remembering a Game of Thrones uh, uh, scene where uh, um, Littlefinger, excuse me, I hope everybody's watched the show, but Littlefinger says to Cersei uh, that I, uh, that information is power, and Cersei says right back, no power is power, as she orders her guards to put a knife to his throat. And it's an example, right, of the different ways that we think power is mobilized in our society. I would say that culture is probably one of the most important, powerful forces uh, in our society, and that often it precedes political change. Um, as norms change, so do the way our politics change, uh, politics function. In order for the civil rights movement to change the way that the center of American culture, in particular white Americans, related to African Americans and what was happening in the South during Jim Crow, uh, 
that had to be forced into the public conversation uh, by folks who said, no, we need to change the norms here. This is not okay. Uh, and that culture change caused political change over time. It caused momentum building uh, towards a shift in our politics. This is happening all the time. Um, and in Israel, a place that is dear to many of us and to the foundation, um, this is also occurring on the ground, right? That a culture of understanding oneself as distinct and different from other communities that, in fact, my, the well-being of my people uh, depends uh, on us not having well-being for another people. It's a very important cultural signifier. Um, and that culture has been building over time for lots of reasons we could get into. We could write a book on this or maybe several books. Um, but that cultural power has led to a political reality that we have to take seriously. So what makes up culture? In addition to the practices, the, the ways, uh, the religious practices that we have, the, the way that we think things are beautiful or ugly, uh, the way we value things, what we're willing to pay for and what we're not willing to pay for, um, there's also these units of culture that are very helpful to define, especially as you're thinking about strategy. And I would say that they're really nested uh, in this sort of, you know, uh, Russian doll setup. Um, first, you have story or stories. I could tell you my own personal story of growing up an interfaith kid and how the Jewish community welcomed me and what that meant uh, for my identity and where I am now in, in helping uh, the Jewish community thrive here in the U.S. and in Israel. Um, that story is nested in within a larger narrative. Right, a narrative of a Jewish community that was struggling during its, you know, the last few decades, maybe, and understanding what interfaith kids from interfaith backgrounds, who they were, uh, how to relate to them, were they Jewish? Um, my parents were part of that narrative too, and then that feeds up into a wider culture and def definition of boundaries and norms. Um, this schema, I think, is really important as we think about the narratives, the stories that we as funders might support the creation of, Fiddler on the Roof, you know, the Yiddish version as one example, and then the larger narrative structure that they're in, in relationship to and why that story is either new, uh, compelling, what does it say about our larger narrative, uh, and then how does it influence a culture. One way to think about this, because metaphors are, you know, super helpful here, uh, they don't say the whole picture, but they're helpful, um, is to think about this, you know, story, narrative, and uh, uh, culture as the relationship between stars, constellations, and galaxies. As funders, I think it's important to notice how a star fits into a wider constellation. What galaxy of work are you interested in? Uh, in working with. Um, and also it helps you define strategy, especially with those of us with, that have resources to be in relationship with a number of grantees. How do you pick which grantees and why? Uh, and looking at these different pieces, stars, constellations, and galaxies can help uh, define and you know, align strategy. So as I wrap up, I just want to say a word about uh, the new work that we're embarking on in Israel around this culture of shared belonging. Uh, it's rooted in a core belief in the necessity of a stronger Israeli democracy and society where everyone truly belongs, Jews, Arabs, everybody, um, and transforming a sense of fear and division to belonging and inclusion. And this is going to be a long-term project of culture change, and we think it will be a precursor and contribute to. Uh, uh, political change. We're going to be thinking about support for bold ideas that are shifting worldviews, ways that we can nurture a sense of radical empathy and solidarity. Um, we're not sure what the vectors of that change will be yet. Will it be arts and culture? Will it be spiritual or religious work? Will it be storytelling, media, fellowships, cultural strategy, uh, or, or what? And we were taking a really expansive view of what the, what the tactics will be as we've defined vision and strategy. We're in the midst of a landscape and strategy analysis. We plan to have more to share with the funding community uh, at the end of 
this year. Uh, and in the meantime, if there are folks who are involved, invested in arts and culture or work in Israel and are interested in exploring with us how this work is unfolding, we're going to be in July with a team um, that will include Aaron Potts, one of the uh, authors of this uh, uh, um, article that I've been citing, and also uh, experts from the Narrative Change Institute and the New Israel Fund uh, exploring together uh, some of this culture change work and where we might want to see it head. So thank you very much. I'm really excited to hear uh, from Jenny uh, and uh, looking forward to a conversation a little later. Sorry, was muted. Um, thank you, Isaac. Appreciate it. It's great stuff. We're going to hold on questions till the end, um, but I want to turn it over to Jenny, who's a founder of Ars Nova uh, and uh, producer of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, as well as Mean Girls and many other Broadway productions that I'm sure you know of. Um, Jenny's, as I said at the outset, coming at this from a, a different perspective, really from being in the field, but also uh, really connecting the work in the field to social change, and I'm sure she'll explain how that all comes together. So, Jenny, turning it over to you. Thanks so much, Lou, and hi, everybody. Um, so I'll, I'll just contextualize a little bit about how I come to this space, because it is really more from uh, the secular view, um, although I am a member of Reboot and back in the day was uh, a co-founder of Juicy.com, which was a website and had some uh, t-shirts that were kind of popular in those days. Um, so I have, I have definitely been in the Jewish space before, but I, I bring to um, this conversation my experience as um, a commercial producer and a not-for-profit producer um, in the secular world. And then it's been really interesting to see how um, I've been able to kind of expand that work into the Jewish field um, and find synergies there. So I'll just speak a little bit about my background because it does kind of inform the path of all of this. Um, I am the co-founder of um, a company in New York called Ars Nova. We are a theater that uh, is designed to support new voices, emerging artists, um, and we have, uh, it, it's really, it's a mission-driven, not-for-profit theater that has supported some really extraordinary voices over the years who've gone on. Our, our most famous alum is Lin-Manuel Miranda, who started at our theater before In the Heights, before Hamilton, um, and been working with him for over 15 years. And so people like Lynn um, have been supported and nurtured all through this, you know, we have a, many programs that kind of bring people through, um, I mean, we joke that it's sort of like a graduate school, but it is really just finding ways to be ser in service to their work. So um, our demographic is incredibly young. 70% of our audiences are between the ages of 18 and 39, which is very, very unusual in theater. And at least 40% of our donations are from people under the age of 40, which also philanthropically is an anomaly. So we have found, um, I guess, that sweet spot with young people. And so we develop, it's not just developing young artists, but we're very interested in nurturing young audiences, our staff, we make sure that they are nurtured as well. and. Um, so I bring to any project I work on that perspective of almost 20 years of working with uh, young people. I was a much younger person when I started. Now I'm kind of aging out of that group, but um, but I still that is really what I'm I'm interested in, and it is very clear that social justice is an incredibly big part of this the generation currently coming up that is a big part of the conversation it's pretty hard to live in the world that we all are in from a political standpoint and not care about social justice and be thinking about those themes so when i was asked to be, become a part of fiddler on the roof in yiddish for me there were two two guiding forces that wanted, uh, that made me want to be involved. The first was purely nostalgic, which was hearing Yiddish 
uh, for the first time since my grandparents were alive and used to argue with each other so we couldn't understand them. Um, I hadn't heard Yiddish spoken like that in so long, so I felt it kind of wash over me in a really beautiful way. But more importantly, the last scene of Fiddler on the Roof, which I've always thought of, I mean, of course, it is a classic musical and it is a Jewish musical. Um, and I've always thought of it that way. But the the week that I went to see the original production of it, um, it was several weeks after the Tree of Life shooting. And it was within a week or so of uh, swastikas being painted on walls and doors at several different universities around the country and suddenly I sat in the audience and it it actually felt subversive hearing Yiddish and seeing in a commercial theater a Yiddish production of Fiddler felt somewhat political and subversive but most interestingly the last scene which is kind of an iconic scene when they leave Anatevka I watched the staging Joel Gray the amazing Joel Gray is our director and he staged it so that the family is walking in a line leaving Anatevka and they are followed by the entire town and it suddenly occurred to me that that was the caravan right there we were watching the original caravan so we decided uh, for World Refugee Day which is coming up on Thursday the 20th coming up um, I have been spearheading an initiative to get every seat in our theater, which seats 500. We've gotten it on the whole day, the whole evening has been underwritten and every seat in the house will be filled with a refugee um, that will start from Holocaust survivors and goes all the way up to current day. Um, I don't know how many different countries are represented, but it is quite a lot of countries. Uh, we're partnering with about 20 organizations that work in the field of immigration and refugees, and they are all bringing 20 to 30 refugees. Um, we have continued also to create a program for the day. So before the day starts, we have several, we've enlisted, we've partnered with Reboot, um, as I think I said, of which I'm a member. And we have several rebooters who are incredible artists in their own right who are contributing to this effort. So uh, we have Jillian Laub, who's an incredible documentarian and uh, a photographer who will be photographing various refugees. Christopher Noxon, who does live sketching. He sketches and then writes in freehand um, a history. It looks like a journal with their faces. It's extraordinary. Uh, Eddie Portnoy has uh, taken an exhibit that he had done a version of at YIVO and has created a, uh, a version of it in our lobby, which now calls, it is now, it was called in the door slam shut. It's now called After Anatevka. And it talks about really what happened uh, during the Harding administration in the early 20s where Jews were kept out of America for not dissimilar reasons of what is happening today. Um, and we are also going to be, we, Nicola Berman, who is a rebooter, has created the most glorious set of prompts, as we're calling them, which are really questions that will be asked of the refugees. Um, many of them are filling it out in advance of coming, uh, but it talks about their story, their voice. And what we're trying to do here is to cast a light on the refugee crisis and the immigration crisis, but through the lens of Fiddler, through a Jewish lens, but also using art as a platform for these kinds of conversations, which as you all probably are aware, you know, Lou is behind that, uh, that whole movement with, with his amazing Canvas project. Um, but, th but this is the idea. Um, so we're using uh, something so we're calling for world world refugee day we're calling it m hashtag where it's going to be a hashtag and a website my fiddler story and we're using that as um, a narrative to kick off a multi-year oral storytelling project which will explore the modern day refugee crisis and uh, the immigration crisis through a Jewish lens 
Um, we want to capture tens of thousands of refugee and immigrant stories for an interactive cross-platform experience that can live on well after Fiddler on the Roof is not running anymore. And we are hoping to capture audio, video, the still images, the sketches, all of these things to develop ancillary projects that will celebrate our nation's diversity and help do a deep dive into the themes of community, assimilation, and collective responsibility. Um, so we'll use celebrity testimonials and we're hoping in the next 12 to 18 months to capture no less than a thousand stories um, and endeavor to dramatize these stories in the best way we can, either through a book or a graphic novel or a series of short films, um, some kind of immersive media experience. So we'll be starting a new phase of funding to do that. Um, but that is really the goal of this. So World Refugee Day is going to be the first, uh, first step in a much larger initiative that will extend beyond refugees and into immigration in general. Um, but for me, it has been deeply, deeply fulfilling because it is a rare thing. I Look, I believe that the arts, uh, the arts are important, of course. I've spent my life in them, and I think that they serve an important purpose for people, but it has felt particularly enriching for me on a personal note to finally see my two worlds intersect, the things that I care about as a human being and the idea of tikkun olam, and then a project which has been extremely successful. I mean, we've we've broken, as an off-Broadway show, we've broken all sorts of records for advanced ticket sales. And um, for that to be happening for a show in Yiddish is such an anomaly and so powerful to me that um, it is incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly happy experience and it feels important to me. So it's nice to see those worlds intersect. So that is just kind of a snapshot of, of what we're doing and what, at least in the very near future, what Thursday will be like for us. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I just wanna to say to the group, if you haven't had a chance to see Fiddler in Yiddish, you must. Um, I, I'm just gonna confess, although I've already confessed this to Jenny, that I approached it with a certain amount of skepticism. I have a lot of experience in the Yiddish world and was concerned that we were kind of going back to a kind of schmaltzy world. This is, I would describe this uh, production as schmaltz-less <clears throat> um, and rather just so unbelievably moving and powerful in all the ways that Jenny just described. I attended it with my 15 year old daughter um, with a, a culture writer for the New Yorker and uh, with a 52 year old Grammy winner um, all of whom were crying by the end. Um, so it clearly was getting through to all kinds of people at all different ages uh, and with all kinds of experiences. So I think we're all just really grateful to you for bringing your expertise to the field um, and showing us what's possible. Thank no, you. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, I want to I, I want to open it up to the group, but I, I just want to start with a couple of quick questions for for the two of you. So. I want to begin with Isaac and just ask, you know, Isaac, having heard um, Jenny's experience and uh, her motivation and, and thinking behind Fiddler in Yiddish, where does that fit in terms of your own thinking and, and the presentation that you just shared with us? How, where, where does that go in the constellation as you were describing it? And uh, tell us a little bit, just so we can kind of put, put it in practical terms for the group. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the Fiddler, Fiddler in Yiddish, which uh, I've not been to see yet, uh, it is on my bucket list, uh, and hopefully I will be able to soon, uh, is, a, is a classic uh, like <clears throat> idea of the star in a constellation. Um, so it exists in a constellation of media, plays, etc., cetera, that, uh, that are different. Um, and one, it's in Yiddish, right? Uh, and and two, it uh, 
It's mm-hmm. about, um, you know, we've, we've done, I think we, we know in sort of Jewish culture, the storytelling around sort of the, the coming of uh, the storytelling around Fiddler and that as like a cultural icon uh, in Jewish life. And for it to come at it in a subversive way and then apply also to uh, the situation we find ourselves in right now where, uh, I mean, to describe the border and what is happening in the border here in the U.S. and globally, but here in the U.S. Um, as anything other than, you know, concentration camps where the folks are, are it's, it's, it's hard, right? It's like, these are the, def- this is the, you know, the actual definition of what's occurring there. Um, and so we know that the experience of, of a Jewish, um, you know, the, the, the idea of being Jewish refugees is core to our storytelling and our history and doing it in such a way that it reifies, you know, sort of works with that story and the subversive and opens it up does change the nature of the larger, uh, culture. I think also it comes uh, in a way, you know, with some velocity, because the Jewish community is like one of these key constituencies that has had an experience of immigration here in the U.S. Um, and yet, and is critical, actually, vi- a vital constituency to be um, speaking out about these issues because of some of the privilege we've accumulated. So it allows us to take our story forward and be in relationship with others. And so. I see that as as moving the culture more broadly and, and also providing a sort of launching pad for an identity, a Jewish identity that is understanding of its history and participating, uh, 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 you know, in, in creating a multiracial democracy. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. And Jenny, let me ask you, <clears throat> and you kind of have a foot in both worlds as both a funder, an artist, someone who's supporting arts. Uh, but also producing arts. Um, How do we find the balance between, I guess what I want to ask you is, are we being too cerebral about the whole thing? Like, how do we find the balance between, you know, creating uh, strategies and kind of coming up with ways to measure impact and the ways that that the the funding community has really started to think about all its its investments? how do we balance that with just whatever kind of leap of faith it might take to to get behind an arts initiative? How do you how do you think about that? Um, it's a great question, and it's funny. I was I was at a meeting recently with um, a company, a very very large company, a beverage company that uh, wants to do a project, and it happens to be an amazing project. Uh, that they have the rights to, and they called us in to talk about it. And they they just kept talking about, you know, what the reach was and the metrics for measuring success, all of the things that, of course, they would ask. I understood that. But at one point in the meeting, I just, I just said, you guys, this is art. We're talking about art. It, it is not measured the same way. And... Um, I understand, of course, having the impulse to try to figure out what kind of impact it's having, but I don't believe anything good comes from approaching it from that way. It is uh, the ancillary benefit of creating good work that is authentic and coming from an authentic place. I mean, I think... um, I think honestly it's less about even being project driven and more about being artist driven and that's that's where our success at Ars Nova has come in it's not that we get behind one specific project one play one musical we get behind the artist and getting behind the artist means over the trajectory of that artist's career they're gonna have some duds and they're gonna have some successes but we are about nurturing that and so I think if the Jewish world could look a little bit beyond just this one project and what kind of impact is that going to have and be more, even though it's hard to do in the little picture because you're looking for, I'm saying return on investment, not necessarily the financial investment, but the bigger investment here, the psychic investment. I think that perhaps just pivoting a little bit and really committing to the idea of supporting these various artists that are of interest 
uh, getting behind that, that's where the best work happens. When an artist feels safe and feels supported, they make great work. And by making great work, that's what you turn out to the world, that's what you present, and that's where you can start to move the needle. So I, I don't know, um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that it does. And, and it actually is kind of consistent with what we hear from venture capitalists or investors who are also thinking about investing in businesses. Obviously, everybody's looking at metrics. You look at metrics, you want to make sure that you have, you fill the seats of the theater. But at the same time, you're making a bet, you're always making a bet. And so you're talking about making a bet on people. Who's who is leading the initiative? And do, do, do they have a track record? Do they inspire? Uh, do I trust that something good is going to come if I can give them a platform? Um, okay, we've... we've I, I, I think oh, that's... I mean, I'd, I'd love to jump in here too because I, I think it's... Um, I think there is a both and here that is about artists being supported to do the work that they need to do, to feel safe to do that, to have the funding to do that the ability to create, the space to create, absolutely critical. Um, if we don't have that, if we don't have more funding in this area, uh, you know, uh, we will have less of that, right? It's just, that's an outcome, right? Uh, yeah. And I think that entry, entrance into this area will need to understand why uh, they should be here. Beyond the uh, experience, with the experience, you want them to have had an, art, an artistic experience, right, that moves them, that they understand from a body place or a heart place why this work is important. And uh, directing them to get involved at a, at a significant level includes, and I think this was what you were pointing to, Lou, right, like the, the fact that the Met gets supported, but the Jewish artists are getting the smaller dollars. So what's preventing the larger dollars for com from coming in? And I think one of the answers um, is, is about not, not just about being comfortable taking risks, but about understanding their why. And I think that artists actually can be in dialogue with funders and could, should be more so. Mm -hmm. um, and then funders have a lot of responsibility there, but the why of artistic creation and what you're trying to move uh, I think what could help mobilize more resources. Um, at least that's that's a hope. I think, and I'm 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 pleased to say that I think JFN's really starting to think very constructively, and we're all talking about how to do that on a broader uh, basis, and how to kind of get all of us thinking that way. Um, I want to. We've we've talked a lot. I want to hear from the group, um, David. I I don't know how to open it up to attendees, but if folks have sure. questions. I mean, I can, you know, I, I think I can unmute anybody who wants to raise their hand to ask a question. I can also um, just field, you know, field questions that anybody has put in in chat. I see Elise has, I, mean, you, I think you can see that as well, has, you know, raised a, an interesting question or, or, you know, point for dialogue if you wanted to jump on that or, or something else or up to you. Yeah, I can't see if people are raising hands. So <clears throat> um, I think everybody can see uh, Elisa's question or comment. Uh, Jenny's exactly right on supporting artists. Impact investment means taking risks. And for some reason, Jewish funders don't feel comfortable supporting this kind of risk. Can anyone explain that? Um, anybody want to try and take that on? Anybody else have in the group have a response to that? I think, I, I think that uh, risk is a really interesting concept in philanthropy because I actually do think that funders do take a lot of risk all the time. They just don't take the risk in the right directions. <laughs> so like there's all kinds of risk of, of putting a bunch of money. I mean, I think that there is, and any, any investment manager will tell you this, like having a portfolio entirely in money market stuff is a losing strategy, right? You're not gonna be able to, to get the, the big returns that you want. So that is a risk in itself. Um, uh, holding back from the investments that you should be making. Um, I think uh, there have been also, I think similar, uh, uh, um, I take this as, as a funder, right? Like I guess in some ways I'm representing the funding community, um, but that there are uh, ways that we have used metrics and measurement 
in order to make ourselves feel more comfortable about the investments we're making, but not because it is actually about measuring success. Hmm. So I think there's a push here that needs to happen on our side, which is sort of what we're hoping will happen, uh, that by orienting into a more fluid structure in which evaluation is actually done in a more creative way where you're interacting with the actual content um, of this piece and participating in it, that that could shift uh, how uh, we do evaluation. Uh, and um, yeah, and I guess lastly, I'd say that the pressure of market forces uh, within the art world uh, and creative world is like the longest conversation. Uh, it's been going on since the dawn of time. Uh, it is a very challenging one, I think, in the Jewish community, given that we have so much philanthropy right now uh, that we can create art for the sake of, uh, you know, what resources want, um, rather than uh, investing in the artistic community to be creative. So um, Isaac posed a question at the very beginning uh, of the discussion, which was just to think about a, a work of art that had moved you in some way or <clears throat> made you think. Um, I posted my answer in the chat window. If you didn't see it, I was talking about uh, having recently reread the novel Call It Sleep by Henry Miller. Uh, uh, sorry, not by, by Hen uh, sorry, by Henry Roth. Um, and for those of you that haven't read it, I mean, it's just an astonishing work of modern literature, Jewish, not Jewish. It really makes you really think like what's, what's possible uh, with Jewish art. Um, I'm curious if anybody else had any uh, uh, suggestions or thoughts or, or a piece of artwork that inspired you. I can guarantee you that, you know, no one was looking over Henry Roth's shoulder saying, um, you know, how are we going to measure the impact of your novel, Call It Sleep? Like, you know, there was just no way. At, at some point, you just had to have faith in, in what he was doing. Um, I see a, a few people are starting to post here, so. Sure, uh, so, I mean, why don't we back up? So, Sivia had asked, uh, if there is a desire to do field building broadly, does this present a challenge with regard to funding individual artists? Right. And anybody want to respond to that or we can? Well, again, I, I just like to speak to the, the idea of um, pivoting or just slightly altering the lens that it gets looked at through maybe in the Jewish world because um, like I can think back to many performers that I've worked with over the years that we did a show that we're like, oh, this is going to be the show that launches them. This is the one, this is the one. And even in retrospect, I'm like, I can't believe that show wasn't successful. And it wasn't successful. But 10 years later, that artist is a huge star and they are making incredible work. Um, and it took that step as part of their their trajectory to get to where they are. And um, I think Elise wrote a few moments ago that, you know, 90% in pharmaceutical companies, as they're testing, 90% of these new products fail. And, you know, if you think about being up at bat and, you know, if, if you have a 300 batting average, it means you fail seven times. So seven out of 10 times you fail. So I think that looking at it as sort of the long game, the bigger picture of, of what it can be, as opposed to knowing you have to hit it out of the park every single time. It's just not realistic. That's not going to happen. And that's okay because in, in art, in, in creating art, part of the way you get there is through failure. I think it's, um, is it IDEO that has the motto, um, uh, fail as often as you can so you can succeed more quickly. Like that is some version of that that I just mangled. But it is the idea that we, we have to support these artists to do their best work so that uh, there, there will be a project down the line that eventually resonates and you are, quote, hitting it out of the park. Mm -hmm. But we have to support them to get to that place. Great, thank you. Other questions, comments? So I'm trying to read what folks are saying at the same time.
Yeah, so Elise is making the point that the purpose of organizations like Foundation for Jewish Culture, JDOB, et cetera, was to be the vetter through expert panels and the like. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that we've been talking quite a lot about, about how important it is for funders to kind of be able to invest in the networks uh, and the organizations that support a broader range of artists that you don't necessarily, if you don't have a sense of confidence about judging great art, put, put an investment in, in the people that do and that spend all their time trying to, you know, assemble, train, uh, network, build relationships among and between great artists and distribution networks and media, et cetera. There are ways, and, and, and you'll be hearing more in the coming weeks about how we're thinking about this through the project that uh, Jenny referenced that we're calling Canvas. Um, that will look specifically at what Elise is talking about, about um, funding those elements of the ecosystem that can then in turn uh, make sure that all ships rise and kind of take the burden off the funder to sort of look through a million different projects and instead focus on the people that are expert at, at picking them and supporting them over the long term. Anybody else? Other questions? We have a couple, just a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, I put a link to the, uh, Shana uh, of Righteous Persons mentioned the report that, um, that they funded. Uh, I also mentioned this at the beginning. Um, it's called Devising Strategies. I put a link in the uh, chat window, um, or you can email me and I can send you that. There's a, another report that we did called Cross Section. Uh, the, the first one uh, surveyed funders, the second one surveyed the field about what's needed in the field. Uh, and based on those two reports, we've really been coming, you know, developing a, a very clear plan for how to move forward uh, and support the ecosystem. So uh, we can't do it without thoughtful funders like Isaac thoughtful producers and creatives like Jenny um, and without the support of JFN. So David, uh, you're, you're the face of JFN today. So we thank you for putting this all together. Uh, well, you do it you. wonderfully all year long and particularly during the conference. So thank you. No, thank you to everybody. And, and Lou, just to be sure you saw, Lisa's asking if you can send the link to the cross sections. Of course, yeah. If that exists the chat window that's great if not we can push it out after yep. but thanks to everybody for for being part of this uh you know we will you can obviously keep connected to jfn for uh future opportunities along along these lines and we hope to see many of you at the conference in march but if nothing else have a great summer and good safe travels anything else you need of course don't hesitate to let us know and thanks if you again. want if you want the link, uh, just don't sign off quite yet. I'm putting it in there right now. You can Great. grab it. It's there. Good. All right. Thank you all. Thanks to everybody for joining. Thank you.